Fox Soul, our voice, our truth. And what that means to me is my music, because my music is the truth, and my voice is real. The song for Prince of an Angel came from me uh, first uh, being asked to co-star in the movie Footprints of an Angel. They asked me to play Nana. And when I got home after filming, I said, well, what is the, the theme song for the movie? And they didn't have one. And I said, you know, I, I think I can write one. And um, the producer said, if you can write it and it's good, It'll be the theme song for the movie. So I started thinking about um, David Ruffin uh, of The Temptation. I said, okay, if I can bring a female vocal version of David Ruffin into 2021 at that time, 2022, it'd be great. And right after that, um, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing came on. 
I was like, if I could do the loop, if I could use the loop at the beginning of Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing and, and put this David Ruffin female vocal thing on it, it would be wonderful. Well, my fiance, Sebastian Thomas, he does beats. So he came home, I told him about it, and uh, he did the loop for uh, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing, came out great. We wrote the song and we felt really, really good about it. Now, I don't know if you know anything about sampling because we sampled the original uh, Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing loop. So we had to get clearance after that. Sony owns the clearance, so we called Sony and they said, oh, we want 7,000 for this, 10,000 for that, 60% of that, blah, 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 that, da, 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 that. I was like, that's crazy. Had to put my thinking cap on and I remembered that I work with Ashford and Simpson who uh, wrote uh, ain't nothing like the real thing. So, uh, and they also, um, on my uh, last um, album, I think it was I Remember, uh, they did snippets with me that they recorded uh, in the studio. So I called Valerie, told her about it, and uh, I sent her the song, and she said it reminded her of Nick, because Nick is no longer with us, Nick Asher, may he rest in peace. And she said, I told them to leave you alone and let you fly. So we got to use uh, the footprints of an angel and the ain't nothing like the real thing sample with the grace of my friend, uh, Valerie Simpson, and not have to pay for it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Morgan is a girl from Queens, New York, born and raised. Oh, Queens was a, a family-oriented uh, community, especially Corona, Queens, New York, where I grew up. I grew up on uh, 109th and 34th Avenue, so they call me the girl from 34th Ave. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was just a family environment. I could go across the street to my girlfriend's house. They could come over to my house after school. You know, everybody looked out for everyone. It it was that kind of community. If I did something wrong, uh, uh, my my friend's mother would come over to my mother and say, you know, she did this, you better get her, tell her to stop doing that. And if my mother seen something, she would tell, you know, on my friends. And that's how we grew up. We walked to school and we walked back from school and, and we had just the wonderful camaraderie of the neighborhood that looked out for the kids, yeah. My parents were normal parents. Margie Morgan, J.P. Morgan, and um, I went to church. Uh, there was a church across the street from me, Mount Horror Baptist Church, and my parents would make sure that me and my sis, Rita, uh, always went to church. And uh, I fell in love with uh, the choir at the church. Uh, there was a, a lady there, and uh, she would have her hair like in this in this bun, and she would just sing the highest notes, and I just fell in love with her. Uh, my mother always loved music, and my mother loved to sing, so they would play Aretha Franklin and James Brown and, uh, oh my God, The Temptations, all those wonderful groups, and I would just sing to the records, me and my sister. And one day I just, uh, like when I was about nine, I, I just like dressed up in my mother's shoes, too big, of course, <laughs> in her outfits, and uh, I just started singing like wailing and my mother loved it. My sister was backing me up and she said, okay, well, the next time they come to our house, you guys are going to put on a show. Now, let me tell you about the, the Starlets of Corona because I love Mount Hart Baptist Church, but I was too young. I didn't like the, uh, you know, going to Bible study and all that. I didn't like that. There was a young lady at the time. Her name was Honret Washington, wonderful musical director. And she started a group called the Starlets of Corona, gospel group. So um, she took me upstairs and she gave me a song, a song called I Must Tell Jesus. And she said, go and learn this song. And uh, if you do good, you know, you'll have a solo spot. And I went and I learned the song. And I'll never forget, it was her and her mother. I learned a song and I sang it. And she said, hold on, wait a minute. And she said, you did real good, Joyce, but you sound just like the record. Go home and learn, you know, how to, you know, make yourself come out of the song. And so um, I tried to learn that. But what happened is that when I actually went and sang the song first time in the church, I started crying. And that was just like the showstopper. So 
After that, the Starless of Corona, everybody else was singing, singing, singing. But the showstopper was this little 10 year old girl singing, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles, all of my troubles. And then I start crying. And it was like, oh my God, oh, she's feeling the spirit. That was me. <laughs> Stay tuned for more tracks and tales. I started singing in school. They started having a talent show. So from singing gospel music, I went into singing at talent shows at John Brown High School and, you know, uh, all, all my other um, preschools before then, IS-61. And um, there was a person that said, well, there's a group uh, that's, that's looking for a singer. You should go audition. So I went and it was in Jamaica, Queens, and I auditioned for a group called Business Before Pleasure. And they were signed to, you won't believe this, they were signed to Sylvia Robinson, which uh, wound up becoming Sugar Hill Records. You remember Sugar Hill Records? Yeah, uh-uh, uh with the Sugar Hill Gang. I signed with them as a, a solo um uh, R&B artist with Business Before Pleasure, and we did a song called In the Prime of Love. Of course, nothing happened to the record because Sylvia was into Sylvia. <laughs> Let's just be honest. You remember that song she did? I, I, you can't compete with this pillow talk of mine. You remember that song? Y'all are too, too young for that. Okay. But anyway, there was a song like that, and Sylvia did that, and then we did Prime of Love, but then in the midst of that, the Sugar Hill Gang, they signed them and came out and hip, hip, hippity hop, and don't stop, rockin' to the bang, bang, boogie, up, dutch boogie, all that stuff, became bigger than uh, Business Before Pleasure. And they went with that and ran with that. So I wind up torn with the group uh, in Canada for a year because uh, they, there was no work here. So we went, I actually graduated high school at 16 and left at like 17 and toured Canada for a year. It, it was kind of weird because when I graduated, you know, my parents were like, well, you graduated early, so uh, how are you going to make money? <laughs> how are you going to take care of yourself? So I started working at Chase Manhattan Bank. And I was one of the first people, I think at like 16, 17 years old, making $25 an hour there. I don't, some people don't even make $25 now, but I was making $25 an hour as a secretary. It's weird, it's it, it 16 years old. And then I uh, came back to New York and started doing the recording scene, singing background for people like Melba Moore, uh, working with Jocelyn Brown, and and even Debbie Allen recorded me, her and her husband. He wound up being my manager later on. That's a whole nother story. But anyway, that's how I got into the music uh, industry as far as recording and people, you know, knowing who Melissa Morgan was. And we went on to uh, do high fashion, uh, uh, feeling lucky lately and working with Johnny Kemp and all those wonderful people. And then I toured with Kashif, <laughs> uh, who was uh, at that time producing Evelyn Champagne King and all those wonderful people. And uh, we're touring with Kashif. Hush Productions, Melba Moore's company, saw me and asked me, did I want my own record deal? And I said, yeah. And um, I think I was on Broadway. Yeah, we was on Broadway opening for Gladys. This is a really true story. I know I'm dropping names, but this is really true stories. So um, I'm on 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 the tour, touring with Kashif, and we did Broadway with Gladys Knight and Melba Moore, husband, who managed Kashif, came in and asked me, did I want my record deal? And I said, yeah. And they said, come in the office, 10 o'clock the next morning, and I went into the office, Hush Productions, and by 11 o'clock, I was signed to Capitol Records. And Patrick Adams, and I forgot about that. Let me tell you about Body to Body. Patrick Adams, who was, uh, he did that song. Y'all are not gonna remember these songs. Push, Push in the Bush. You mean that Push, Push in the Bush? 
He don't know that song either. Oh, well, anyway, it was a big hit song for for this group, and Patrick Adams wanted us to come in and sing background. It was me, my friend Cookie, and my other friend Don Hamilton. We were great background singers, and we went in and sang, and the lead singer never showed up. And he said, can one of y'all sing, you know, this song? And uh, the song was too high for Cookie, and he didn't want a male. So they said, I said, I could do it. And he said, well, I'll pay. This is how, how, how the money was between now and then. They paid us $50 <laughs> to sing background. And then he said, well, if you sing lead, I'll pay you an additional $75. And I said, oh, my God, I'm going to make $125 today. I can't believe it. I'm going to tell my dad he ain't going to believe this. So I go sing this song, Body to Body, and I make this $125. And two weeks later, it is on the radio. Yeah, and it winds up being a number one dance song, and uh, uh, that's a whole long story. They wanted to put a group together. I didn't like the group, so my friend, who was a booking agent, started booking me as Melissa Morgan, the lead singer of this group called Shades of Love, who did Body to Body, and that's when I started making real money. I made my first $1,500 at a place called Bonds, singing Keep in Touch Body to Body. Well, the the whole thing, because we were in the studio and it was a, a, a studio session with with background singers and studio singers, and then I went on to sing the lead, there was no group called Shades of Love. They, they just made Shades of Love this name, and then they released it with my voice on it, and then they said, okay, uh, the producer guy said, okay, we're going to put a group together. And so they put the girls, they, they were fabulous looking girls, I'm not going to take that away, and they could dance and they could do all of that, but they couldn't sing. And so after about three rehearsals, I was like, I can't do it. I, I, I just can't go on the road and sing with you because my reputation is going to be put on the line singing with non-singers. So, um, like I said, my, my friend, uh, Don Hamilton, who was one of the singers, he booked acts in clubs all around New York. He had booked Sharon Red and other people like that, Jocelyn Brown, people like that. And he said, uh, I can book you as, um, Melissa Morgan, the featured uh, vocalist of Shades of Love. And that's what he did. So I actually went out with no group and just, you know, sang by myself and made lots of money, made lots of money. And then the producers threatened me. <laughs> they said, if you don't stop singing, you know, by yourself, because you can't use the name Shades of Love, you know, we're, we're going to sue you and blah, 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 blah. But I never stopped and they never sued me. And it was just talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, even with High Fashion, High Fashion was a group that was put together with me and Allison Williams and the other gentleman. I can't remember his name now. And um, it, it was Petrus. And we wanted to work with him because he had had so much success with the group change, you know. Um, and they just never put these groups together right for me. I, I tried with Allison and them and, uh, they took, took me on tour with, uh, uh, the BBQ band and, uh, it just, it never felt right. I always felt like, you know, what I had to offer was bigger than the group. So, um, after, after that experience, I didn't want, I didn't want to do the group anymore. I didn't mind singing, going on the road because I toured with Shaka Khan singing background, which I loved, and Kashif, and, you know, all these wonderful people. I didn't mind doing that, being hired to sing background, but I didn't want to be in a group anymore. Yeah. You know, as as a person, I, I think I grasped uh, kindness, because I really tell you, Shaka Khan had, had a kindness. She really took me under her wings, and 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 really helped me develop to not be afraid because when i f first started singing when I, I had come out from the cellar singing with johnny kemp and um again that was like a group situation but i was the lead female singer and johnny kemp was the male 
uh, a lead singer and we would uh, sing at the cellar doing three shows a night child i'm telling you we were working with uh we would do three shows a night there mikhail's under the stairs it was really a great learning experience and then i got the call to sing with shaka khan and i thought it was a, a joke i hung up the phone it was like oh uh this is lisette wilson who wind up being my producing partner and writing partner. But she's like, I'm a musical director with Shaka Khan and, and Besta Williams uh, said to hire you because she saw you at the cellar. And I was like, yeah, right. And I hung up. And she was like, girl, if you hang up on me again, it's going to be me and you. <laughs> so um, I, I went and auditioned for Shaka. And it was really weird because she was coming from doing a show, a TV show. And I had to wait in the lobby for her. And when she walked in, you know, I had kind of like the bigger hair like her. She said, you must be the singer, you know. And, and Shaka is a cursor, you know. So you don't know she's a cursor. So I said, yeah, I'm the singer. She says, come on, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, that was it. She took, took me in the elevator and she said, can you sing? And I was like, if I couldn't sing, I wouldn't be here. Stay tuned for more tracks and tales. So, um, you know, that was it. She took, took me in the elevator and she said, can you sing? And I was like, if I couldn't sing, I wouldn't be here. And she said, that's what I'm talking about. And I sang a couple of songs with her and she said, you're hired. But she took me on her wings and like one time she was hoarse and she was like, Melissa, you sing, you sing my part and I'm just going to mouth it because, you know, I'm, I'm hoarse tonight. And then, you know, I'm going to come up to you and we're going to like make it like a big thing. And she did. And, I, and, and after I did that, she said, you sing that part from now on. And and she was just really, really generous and, and caring. And um, uh, that's what I learned as a person. Uh, as a singer, I learned not to do anything to alter your voice. So I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do any of that stuff because I have seen how that kind of stuff alters your voice and to each his own that they want to smoke cigarettes or do whatever they do that's fine but um being on the road i learned to protect your instrument protect your gift so i don't do any of those things and never have never will and um, that's why i think hopefully i can still sing today while i was singing with shaka uh her musical director lisette wilson we became really really good friends and Lisette is responsible for the hit song Funkin' for Jamaica uh, with uh, Tom Brown. We just started, you know, she would, we would be rehearsing or, or doing sound check with Shaka and she started playing stuff and I started singing, you know, and she was like, after this, we, we, we need to do something together. I was like, that would be great. And when I got my deal, from that time on Broadway when Hush came and saw me and they signed me, I said, okay, I have someone that I want to work with. I want to work with Lisette Wilson. So they, they told us, you know, hey, we're going to give you this time. Go in the studio, write some songs, and come back and let us hear it. During that time, we wrote Fool's Hat Ice. We wrote Do You Still Love Me? We wrote uh, Now or Never. We wrote a whole bunch of songs and every song that we went in and let them hear, they approved it for the album. And that's how Do Me Baby, the album came about.
that was in the 80s when we did uh, Fool's Paradise. And um, that was when we were recording uh, the Do Me Baby album. And I was staying in Jamaica, Queens with Lisette Wilson at our house because her parents had moved down south and she had the whole house. So, you know, we was like, we'll stay here. We're going to get this because we're going to get these hits. So she would record during the day. And I would record at night because I didn't like, re I don't like recording during the day for some reason. So um, I told her, because we had worked with Shaka Khan and she was Shaka Khan's musical director. I wanted something that would be, you know, inspirational, you know, with Shaka in mind. And I always loved uh, that title, Fool's Paradise. Um, so she went in and, and, and did this track and it just... It drew me to that title, even though we're talking about two different things. Shaka's talking about something else in hers, and I'm talking about something else in mine. I wanted the the song to be called Fool's Paradise with the same title. So um, I went in and I did it. And, you know, it was so weird because Lissette said, this is going to be your breakout hit once we did it because I went at night and recorded she heard it the next morning and she came up and she said this is going to be a breakout hit and I said I don't, I don't think so I think you know Do Me Baby is going to do its thing and that's that well what do you know uh 30 years later I mean it is just like it's like it came out yesterday I can't go anywhere and not do that song it is a basically a national anthem in London uh, um, they, they hired me to come over there and sing it. And when I tell you that everyone in London knows that song, in the UK knows that song, everyone in New York knows that song, everyone in Chicago knows it, everyone in Philadelphia knows that song. It's just recently, I tell you this, Nas did a documentary on the Supreme Team uh, uh, about the guys who, you know, did the drug dealings back in, in, in Jamaica back in the day. And uh, they played Fool's Paradise in uh, the documentary because I'm a girl from Queens. So uh, thank you, Nas. It's been featured. LL Cool J has covered it. Uh, Mary J and Jay-Z has covered it. And I did the remix to that for Can't Knock the Hustle. Um, it was part of the theme song for Love and Hip Hop Miami. Um, and uh, the checks keep coming in. So thank you. <laughs> Fox Soul, our voice, our truth. And what that means to me is my music, because my music is the truth, and my voice is real.
I love Prince, but Do Me Baby was not my idea. It was a gentleman named Don Grierson that was the president of Capitol Records when I signed, who said that uh, the next female R&B artist I signed has got to do this song because he didn't want a male to do it, and I was that next female. Paul Lawrence um, had a great production on that song. Um, he went in and he knew exactly what to do. Now here's the kicker. Paul Lawrence kept saying that high note, that high note that I hit, higher. <coughs> and I was like, oh, I, higher. I do it higher. He said, higher. I was like, okay, you know, come on. I'm, I'm going to be bleeding in a minute. I can't, I can't sing any higher. He says, okay, don't sing it any higher. We're good. And uh, he actually went in and raised it. A uh, uh, half step higher uh, because what he was looking for, I guess I didn't do it. So he raised it a half step higher and then he did all those repeater do, 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 me, baby, which was, you know, innovative and, and, and something new at the time. So uh, I thank Paul Lawrence for, for having that uh, creative uh, mind to think about that song and me like that. And till this day, now I have to sing that song a half a step higher live. So <laughs> in my career, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy because um, I'm not getting the money that I'm supposed to be getting. So by the second album, now I'm looking at um, Hush Productions, who not only was, uh, was my production company, uh, they own some of my uh, publishing, uh, not the songwriting, but publishing. They gave me a publishing deal through Hush, and they were managing me. So now we have just a little conflict of interest because now I'm saying, okay, 
I sign with you with the management deal and I'm supposed to make this amount of money every year and I didn't make that amount of money. Okay, now I'm signing with you with publishing and my publishing is almost up. Even though at that time, you know, the publishing deal, I think it was getting like two or $3,000 a, a month. You know, uh, the songs were, you know, Do Me Baby was almost like 400,000 sold. So the the money for the publishing and what I was getting was not balancing out. So um, I went to Hush and said, hey, uh, we're not gonna worry about the publishing, just make sure as management, you said I'm supposed to make $150,000 or whatever it was for that year, you're short $50,000 or whatever it was. Pay me the $50,000 and we can move on. Well, they didn't wanna pay me the $50,000, so you know, I had the right to walk and I walked. And uh, uh, that, that became a whole nother uh, situation within itself. Yeah. With Hush, it, they, they were still family. I, even when I left them, I still loved them because, you know, they were the first ones to sign me to my major deal and, and catapult Melissa Morgan. So you, you can't hate someone that, that, that did that to you. This industry, it costs money. You know, and, and when you first get in and you, it, and you think, oh, well, a hundred thousand, two hundred, three hundred thousand to do it. And then you've got somebody like me and a Freddie Jackson that's used to five hundred thousand dollar budgets on our own five hundred to a million. You know, it, it costs too much to keep going. So uh, they fold it. Yeah. What I want Melissa Morgan, the artist and the vocalist to be known as is the voice that always sang the truth. Whether it was love songs, whether it was you hurt me songs, whether it was, you know, like my new song, Footprints of an Angel, where I talk about losing a loved one. I just want my my vocals and my songwriting and and what I represent to always be known as the truth, that I never lied, you know, as an artist to be successful or pretend to be someone that I'm not. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to be remembered for. Yeah, and don't mess with my money. <laughs>
20 on my feet. Cause you're glistening in the light Baby, come through, let's have the perfect day I wonder if this is a summer fling Can it escalate? Let me know now if I should go now Cause I've been so scared of love I tried giving it up Do we want it enough? Let's fly to the sun Baby, I through my stereo Can you bring joy to my life? I can hear you wondering The one thing I love about R&B is the way we get to express ourselves. Music in general, you get to express yourselves, but R&B is more about feeling. It's about feeling the music and putting your feelings inside of the music. And if you know, you know, you can't, you can't make R&B without feeling. You think you're going to make a good soulful song without being in touch with the world or whatever you're singing about. You got another thing coming. First person I told I wanted to be an artist was myself. Like a literal conversation into the mirror. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. There is no plan B, C, D, E, and F. And not to get off topic, but for the young kids out there, if you're trying to do something, achieve it. No plan B, C, D, or E, F, no matter who tell you. But yes, I was the first person to tell. That's what I wanted to do. My family is full of singers. It was a family gift passed down. My grandmother was a leader of a gospel group. My father was second in command. My mother was a singer too. Uh, first time I performed was in church. I was singing in the choir where I live at, Jersey City. And turnout was amazing. Actually, I didn't think I was going to do good, but that's the perks of having a singing family. Gospel music means the foundation of who I am because without it, I wouldn't have had the upbringing that I have. I wouldn't be able to know, you know, my, my grandmother telling me about the family gift was surrounded about, around Pardon me, surrounded around gospel. So without gospel, I feel like I wouldn't have been able to tap into the voice and the passion that I have now. So yeah, gospel music means to me the foundation of everything. Step on the scene, it ain't a stuff on my sneak suit, baby. And if niggas get in between, I can fast like we switching the scenes. I might cut you, baby. It's time to set it off, yeah, yeah. Let everything go down tonight. Girl, it's time we set it off, yeah, yeah. They brought the king out down the ride. I let go, baby. If you follow my lead, I won't stray your fool again. Ready, set, go. Please don't talk to me if you can't mess with the kind of man. I ain't sorry at all. I can't play that part. Won't play it at all. We can play our song. I can't afford to fall. Can't stare into the preview. I played a fool on 
Smell the money through the breeze, put on a sweater. Let the mothers know you and me. Watch the effect that we cause when we step on the I ain't scene. Sorry at all. I can't play that part. Won't play it at all. We could play our song. I can't afford to fall. Can't stare into the preview. I played a fool on purpose. musical goal is to be heard. I think any any artist in the world that's striving, doing music, just wants to be heard. But when you're in a cluttered environment, I would so to say, from where I live, Jersey City, New Jersey, shout out to y'all, big force. It's hard to really voice yourself. And then on top of where I'm at, I'm a young black male, so they just already label me violence and they really overlook. So with music, it's, it's, it's a way I can express myself. It's a way I can speak without being judged, so to say. Our voice, our truth. And that means to me, it don't matter the color of your skin. It don't matter the content of your character. It don't matter where you came from. It's you. You put your all into it. The whole world would accept it. The whole world, they won't have no choice but to accept it because it's your truth. And if they can't, wish I could stick that finger up, but big force. <laughs>